everyone welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with molly if you are new around here if you've never seen my face before then hi my name is molly and i post true crime videos like this every single week so if you think that is something that you might want to stick around for then please do subscribe i just want to let you guys know that this video is very kindly sponsored by the stereo app which i will tell you more about shortly but this week we are going to be talking about about a serial killer case a female serial killer case in fact and i haven't covered a female serial killer in a while i don't think today we are going to be talking about nanny doss who was responsible for around 11 murders possibly even more and these murders were committed between 1927 and 1954 she is definitely one of the creepiest serial killers that i have come across and she was given many Many nicknames by the media such as the Black Widow, the Lonely Hearts Killer and the Giggling Granny and you'll understand why as we go through the story. But before we get into the case, as promised, let me just tell you about Stereo. So Stereo is the premier live broadcast social platform that enables people to have and discover real conversations in real time. So compared to recorded podcasts, all talks on Stereo are live and you can listen to other people's shows or you can put on your own shows with either your favorite co-host so you could host a show with someone that you know like a friend or a family member or alternatively stereo can automatically pair you with someone new all you have to do is download the app create your personalized avatar and you are good to go i've already done three shows on stereo so far and they were so much fun i did one show with my sister daisy and we just had a bit of a chat we talked about what she does for work we talked about our childhood just random things really i've also done two shows with one of my best friends kirsty sky who i'm sure you guys are familiar with she is also a true crime youtuber do you guys have any um plans for um valentine's day <laughs> no i don't <laughs> not at all oh not. actually that is a lie i do i do have plans Basically, me and my sister are doing Galentine's. <laughs> so we've given each other a budget. That. We've given each other a budget of thirty pounds, and we've done a bit of online shopping, and we've got each other a few little bits. That's so um, cute. <laughs> I don't really know why we did it, but we just thought, you know what? Neither of us have Valentine's. Both of us are single. Why not treat each other? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sisters. So. Woo. In our second show, myself and Kirsty actually talked about the TV show Friends because we are both huge fans we are friends obsessed and so we did each other like a little friends quiz it was amazing <laughs> and i'm going to be doing another show with kirsty on the 25th of february at around 2 p.m and in this show we are going to be doing a true crime q a so i would love it if you guys could get involved one of my favorite things about stereo is that listeners of your show are actually able to send you voice messages whilst you are live so whilst me and kirsty are hosting our next show you can send in any questions that you may have for us and we can answer them so if you would like to listen to my previous shows and my upcoming show with Kirsty, then all you have to do is click the link in my description box download stereo create your own profile and avatar and then you'll be notified when i next go live once again a huge thank you to stereo for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel and now let's just get into the case of nanny doss so for today's case we are going all the way back to the year 1905 in Blue Mountain which is a neighborhood in Anniston in Alabama in the US. It was the 4th of November 1905 when Nanny Doss was born. Now Nanny's birth name was actually Nancy Hazel so I think Nanny was just a nickname that she was called all throughout her life. Nanny's parents were called James and Louisa Hazel although there is actually speculation that James may not have been Nanny's biological father. According to a book I read about this case her mother Louisa may not have known the biological father of her baby and of course at this time in the early 1900s this brought shame to her and her family because she wasn't married she was 
having a baby out of wedlock and due to this Louisa was just kicked out of the house by her family they didn't want anything to do with her until she could tell them the name of her unborn baby's father so they could organize a quick shotgun wedding so Louisa was effectively just out on the streets on her own and pregnant however she was able to earn some money doing some odd jobs for a couple of people around the neighborhood in Blue Mountain until eventually in early November of 1905 she gave birth to her first child a daughter called Nancy or Nanny so now that Louisa had given birth she was pretty much a ruined woman to the community because she didn't have a husband however surprisingly about a week after nanny was born louisa was proposed to by a local farmer and his name was james hazel and james took baby nanny on too it didn't seem to bother him that louisa already had a child as it probably would have bothered other men back then from then on he just saw nanny as his own daughter so it may seem Seem like James Hazel was a really nice guy taking on Louisa and her baby but that's not the case. James could actually be really really mean to Louisa. As soon as James got a little bit stressed he would take it out on his wife Louisa. He would order her around and he was you know both verbally and physically abusive. He would just insult her constantly and he would hit her with a cane that he used on the farm. He just really was not a nice guy. Now as you would expect there were a lot of jobs to do on James this farm and so most of the time James and Louisa would be doing these jobs they would be out working on the farm which meant that their daughter nanny was pretty much ignored for the first few years of her life and as soon as she was able to nanny was also put to work on the farm even when she was a very young child she was put to work on the farm eventually louisa and james had another four children they had one son and another three daughters so in total they had five children and nanny being the eldest was the one who really took care of her younger siblings who were babies. Whilst her mother and father were out working on the farm she would feed her siblings and wash them and change their nappies and bear in mind she was literally a child herself. When Nanny was around five six years old in 1910 when other children her age were just starting school her parents James and Louisa made Nanny stay home and look after the younger children. Now Nanny absolutely hated her father James and she hated him ever since she was a very young child. He was also abusive towards his children just like he was towards his wife. James was just so strict. He saw himself as the ruler of the family and everyone had to do what he said and as soon as the other children were old enough he also put them to work on the farm occasionally he would allow the children to go to school but most of the time he demanded that they stayed home and worked for him he cared very little about them getting a proper education and of course because they hardly ever went their performance at school and their work was very very poor and they hated that especially nanny all she really wanted to do was learn the other kids in school would tease the hazel children because well one they weren't the smartest because they were so behind with their learning and two because they came from a rather poor background the hazel family didn't really have that much money and so the kids were bullied and made fun of a lot as nanny got older she developed a love for reading and and when she read a book it was like she was entering a different world and it meant that she could escape her unhappy home life even if just for a little while. She especially loved reading magazines and books that were specifically about romance and from reading this kind of thing she developed a dream of having the perfect romance of her own one day in the future. She wanted the perfect romantic future. In the year 1912 when Nanny was around seven years old 
involved, she was involved in an accident that would ultimately have an effect on her for the rest of her life. One day, her and her family were travelling on a train down south because they were going to spend the weekend with some of James's family that lived there. Whilst they were on the train, Nanny was just reading a romance magazine to occupy herself as she usually did. However, all of a sudden, the driver of the train had to slam on the brakes because he spotted a pine tree on the railway track that had been knocked down by a storm. So like I said, he immediately slammed on the brakes, he stopped the train, causing everyone on the train to fall forward. Now everyone else on the train was pretty much fine. They did have a few cuts and bruises on their legs, but they were okay. However, the same couldn't be said for seven-year-old Nanny. You see, she was seated right in front of a metal bar, and so when the train just stopped suddenly, Nanny went flying and she hit her head on this metal bar and this knocked her unconscious. And it's believed that this injury left her with permanent brain damage. And from this point on, all throughout her life, she suffered with very painful headaches and migraines. She would experience blackouts and she would also go through periods of severe depression. And as I'm sure a lot of you know, many other serial killers have also suffered head injuries in the past. For example, Fred West, um, Richard Ramirez, I think John Wayne Gacy, and Nanny Doss had one too. As Nanny began entering her teenage years, her hatred for her father James only grew. Like I said, he was very, very controlling and he would not allow his daughters to wear anything that enhanced their appearance. So they weren't allowed to wear pretty dresses, they weren't allowed to experiment with makeup. Just normal things that many young girls like to play around with, they were not allowed to do. And they also weren't allowed to even just be friends with boys. They were forbidden from having any kind of interaction with the opposite sex. Because James was convinced that if his daughter Daughters made themselves look more attractive by putting on makeup and wearing dresses then they would be molested by someone. He was just so so possessive of his daughters and this one time he caught Nanny recreating a hairstyle that she had seen in a magazine and James went mad and he beat her with his cane. But despite all of this abuse, Nanny was still very interested in romance. However, it seems as though this interest soon became more of an obsession for Nanny. She became obsessed with the idea of some handsome man falling in love with her and taking her away from her life on the farm, taking her away from her abusive father and pretty much any spare time she had she would spend it reading about love and romance and she soon started reading the Lonely Hearts columns in magazines and newspapers. I think I've explained this in a video before but the Lonely Hearts column if you don't know was like a section in the newspaper where single people would basically just advertise themselves. I actually don't know if it's still a thing in newspapers today, but people would just write their name, their age, their occupation, and what they were looking for, and they would wait for a response from other single people. And like I said, Nanny began reading through the Lonely Hearts columns, just like she would read through her romance magazines and books. At around 15, 16 years old, Nanny started looking for her own job, because her family's farm was really not making much money, and so she had to help with the income and it didn't take long for her to find one. She started working at the linen thread mill factory in Blue Mountain and she seemed to really enjoy working there. She made a lot of friends and she was very popular amongst her colleagues and it was while she was working in the factory that she met a man named Charles Braggs who also worked there. Charles was a 17 year old tall handsome young man and he really liked Nanny Hazel 
so he was smitten with her in fact and nanny seemed to really like him too and surprisingly so did her parents he was invited around for dinner one evening and both louisa and even james took a liking to charlie braggs and so after just four months of dating the two married after they married nanny moved in with charles and his mother who i believe he cared for however nanny hated living with charlie's mother she was quite similar to nanny's father james in the sense that she was very very controlling and she found errors and faults in absolutely everything nanny did nothing nanny did was ever good enough for this woman whilst charles would go off to work nanny would stay home most of the time and tidy the house so it would just be her and her mother-in-law and she would just critique nanny constantly and she was overly protective of her son actually i don't know if protective is even the right word i think possessive is a better word she didn't really like her son and his wife spending any time together on their own like for example if charles and nanny had planned to go out for a meal just the two of them his mother would come up with a reason as to why they couldn't go like she would say that she suddenly fell ill so they had to stay home and look after her nanny just could not stand this woman she put such a strain on her relationship with charlie and it was even worse because charlie would never stand up to his mother and nanny began to realize that this married life wasn't all she had dreamed of for so many years her main ambition was to leave her family home and marry the man of her dreams and have the perfect romantic future but this was far from a happy life for her but despite this realization about two years after nanny and charles married in 1923 nanny gave birth to their first child and within the next three to four years she gave birth to three more children so in total they had four children four girls actually they had four daughters and they were all born very close together and nanny found it extremely difficult to care for all of these children she became very very stressed and so she began drinking a lot of alcohol as a coping mechanism and she also began cheating on her husband charlie she would go to different bars and drink and sleep with different men however charlie was also being unfaithful he was having multiple affairs and he would just disappear for several days at a time and drink and cheat on his wife so their marriage was just really falling apart and then one day in 1927 not long after the birth of their fourth daughter charles returned home after he had been away drinking and sleeping with other women to find that two of his children had just suddenly died as i said nanny and charles had four daughters and the two middle ones who i believe were called zalma and gertrude just unexpectedly passed away one minute the girls were perfectly healthy and the next they were dead so what had happened to them well it was believed by doctors that their cause of deaths was food poisoning accidental food poisoning from the porridge that they had eaten for breakfast that morning and to everyone around her nanny seemed to be devastated heartbroken about the loss of two of her children however her husband charles wasn't buying it he had his suspicions that this was no accident in fact he firmly believed that his wife nanny had actually poisoned the children herself because she couldn't cope with the stress of having four young children and so he believed that she decided to just get rid of two of them and he was 
terrified. He was so scared that she would try to poison him and their other two children and so he decided to leave. One night Charles packed his bags and he woke up their eldest daughter Malvina and they fled without Nanny realising. I believe he did plan on taking his youngest daughter Florine with him too. However he left in the middle of the night and Florine was sleeping next to her mother Nanny. So he just couldn't take her because he couldn't risk Nanny waking up and realising what he was doing and he also didn't take his mother, he left his mother behind as well. However shortly after he fled his mother actually passed away too but from what I can gather Nanny didn't do anything to her, I think the mother did just pass away naturally because she was old. Nanny and Charles divorced officially in 1928 and eventually Charles return to Blue Mountain with his eldest daughter Malvina and also a new wife. He quickly married another woman who was a widow and she had a son of her own and all four of them returned to Blue Mountain because Charles wanted his house back. Nanny was living in his house where he used to live with his mother and now that he had this new family he wanted it back and he wanted Nanny to leave and so she she did, she packed up all of her things and she went back to her parents home, the farm, taking her two remaining daughters, Malvina and Florine, with her. And Charles just moved on with his life with his new family. He had a lucky escape from Nanny because it would turn out that he would be the only one of her husband's that she didn't murder. Now that she was back home and recently divorced, Nanny returned to her love of reading romance books and romance magazines and she soon started chatting to the men who had advertised themselves in the Lonely Hearts columns because she wanted to find someone else. She was looking for love and one of these men that she began speaking to from the column was 22 year old Robert Franklin Harrelson, a factory worker from Jacksonville. 22 year old Robert and 24 year old Nanny would exchange romantic letters and Nanny would send Robert pictures of herself and they very quickly fell in love, married and moved in together in a two bedroom property in Jacksonville with Nanny's daughters. However this relationship was also not a happy one. Robert would drink a lot, he had a temper and he actually had a criminal record for assault and he would often go out drinking and he would regularly get into fights with people from bars. He could be very violent when he was drunk and he would sometimes just go into a rage and he would hit his wife Nanny. But despite all of this abuse, their marriage actually lasted a lot longer than Nanny's first marriage to Charles. Robert and Nanny were together for around 16 years and during this time her two daughters, Alvina and Florine obviously grew up and soon became adults themselves and when her eldest daughter Malvina was 18 years old she married a man named Mosey Haynes in 1942 and in 1943 the young couple had their first child. It was a little boy who they named Robert Jr just like Nanny's second husband Robert so Malvina's stepfather and then two years after the birth of Robert Jr in 1945 Malvina and Mosey had another child and this time it was a healthy baby girl. Now Malvina's second birth was a very difficult and long one. It was quite traumatic for her and by the end of it she was very tired and very weak. She was so exhausted that she didn't even have the strength to hold her newborn and so the baby was handed over to its grandmother Nanny who was sat by her daughter's bedside. However at one point the doctors and medical staff left the room for probably only a couple of minutes but by the time they had arrived back Malvina's baby girl was dead. Now examination of the baby's body showed no clear cause of death and so doctors just assumed that because the birth was a lengthy one the baby had most likely just been deprived 
of oxygen for too long and was just unable to survive on its own they thought it was just a horrible uncontrollable accident however Malvina believed otherwise she did not believe that her baby's death was from a lack of oxygen she believed that her mother nanny had murdered the child. Malvina confided in her sister Florine that just after the birth when everyone left the room and it was just her nanny and the baby she swore she witnessed nanny getting out a hat pin which is a pin that is used for securing a hat to your head. Malvina said that she saw nanny get out a hat pin and force it into the newborn baby's head. Now at the time Malvina just thought that it was a horrible horrible nightmare because she was so exhausted from the birth however when she woke up and realized that her baby was actually dead she was sure that this nightmare was actually the truth nanny had murdered her own granddaughter but unfortunately malvina couldn't really do anything she couldn't prove that this was true and she knew that probably no one would believe her anyway because nanny really came across as a loving and caring grandmother no one would have believed that she would have been capable of doing such an awful thing not long after the death of their daughter malvina and mosey separated and malvina soon began dating another man who was a soldier and nanny really disapproved of this relationship she really did not like this man for whatever reason and she told Malvina that she told her that she did not approve of this relationship and just a few months after the death of Malvina's daughter on the 7th of July 1945 she and her mother nanny had a huge argument about Malvina's new boyfriend after this argument Malvina decided to go and stay with her father Charles for a little while and she left her son Robert Jr in the care of her mother nanny which would ultimately seal his fate. Robert Jr., this healthy young boy, just suddenly mysteriously died later that same night and doctors were not really sure what caused his death and so it was ruled that he had died from asphyxia from unknown causes. Again, just like the death of his little baby sister, it seemed to be just an awful unexplained accident. However, once again, that wasn't the case. His grandmother, Nanny, had actually murdered him. Now, I'm not sure exactly how Nanny killed Robert Jr. One source said that she probably choked the little boy to death, whereas a book I read about this case said that she actually poisoned him with rat poison. She apparently put this poison into some cookies that she baked, and then slowly throughout the day, she fed Robert these cookies until he died and just a few months after Robert Jr's death she collected the $500 life insurance policy that she had previously taken out on the boy so now this woman had allegedly killed two of her own children and two grandchildren and her second husband Robert Frank Harrelson was next. One evening in September of 1945, Frank came home and he was very, very drunk. He had spent pretty much the entire day drinking with his friends to celebrate the end of World War II. And when he eventually returned home to his wife Nanny, he forced himself on her and raped her and so she decided to kill him. The following day she poured some rat poison into her husband's whiskey bottle and on the 15th of September he died. And following his death she collected his life insurance money and with it she brought herself a plot of land and a new house in Jacksonville. So now 40 year old Nanny was single once more and she quickly went back to the Lonely Hearts columns to find her next husband and it 
doesn't take long for her to find one. Soon she starts writing letters to a man named Arlie Lanning who was from Lexington in North Carolina. And just two, three days after they met in person, Arlie and Nanny were married. They didn't waste any time. However, much like her previous husband, Robert Frank Harrelson, Arlie Lanning was also an alcoholic and Nanny just couldn't really be bothered with it this time. So she would often just leave her husband, leave their home for sometimes months at a time. When she returned home, her husband, Arlie, would promise to change and promise to stop drinking alcohol. But as soon as he would slip up, nanny would be off. She would just travel across the country, cheat on her husband and eventually she would go back home. And once she was home, she would be the perfect doting wife for a short while but like I said as soon as Arlie would slip up and start drinking again she would leave so it was just this cycle really. However this cycle ended in the year 1950 when Arlie Lanning became Nanny's next murder victim just two years after they married. He suddenly became very very ill. He had a fever, he was vomiting constantly, he had excruciating stomach pains and people just believed that he had the flu but of course that was not the case. His wife had actually been poisoning him. She had been mixing poison into his alcohol and into his meals until eventually Arlie Lanning passed away. Nanny told people that Arlie had died from a heart attack and as she did with the deaths of her previous victims, she pretended to be absolutely heartbroken by the loss. And people felt so sorry for this poor woman. Two of her husbands had just suddenly died now and Nanny received so much sympathy. In fact, people would even give Nanny money because they felt so bad for her and they wanted to support her, which is really exactly what she wanted. It seems as though one of her main motives for these murders was money, the money from their life insurance policies. And soon after Lanning's death, she collected the money as usual. Now, Arlie Lanning's house in North Carolina was actually left to his sister in his will and not his wife. And Nanny was not happy about this. So she decided to set the house on fire and burn it down. And according to one source I read, Arlie's sister actually died in the house fire, making her another victim of this serial killer. And the insurance money from the house went straight in Nanny's pocket. Following the death of her third husband, Nanny moved in with Arlie's mother, so her mother-in-law, although as you've probably guessed, she didn't live for long after Nanny moved in. It's believed that Nanny killed her as well via her usual method of poison. After this, Nanny moved in with one of her sisters whose name was Dovey and Dovey was not very well. She had cancer and so Nanny moved in to help care for her but eventually Nanny ended her life too. Two years after the murder of her third husband, Nanny married a man called Richard Al Morton in October of 1952. This time she actually didn't meet her husband through a Lonely Hearts column. Instead, she decided to become a member at a singles club called the Diamond Circle Club and that is where she met Richard. He was from Kansas and so when they married Nanny moved in with him there and Nanny really started to think that maybe she had found her perfect man because unlike her previous husbands Richard didn't drink and he didn't seem to be abusive although he was a bit of a ladies man and he would spend a lot of time with other women despite the fact that he had a wife 
although Nanny didn't actually realise this for a while because she was busy caring for her mother. You see, by January of 1953, Nanny's mother Louisa was a widow because her husband, James Hazel, had passed away. And so Louisa had to go and live with her oldest daughter, Nanny, because she needed a full-time carer due to the fact that she had recently fallen over and broken her hip. But of course, she didn't survive for long whilst being in Nanny's care. Just a couple of days after she moved in with her daughter, Louisa started experiencing very painful stomach cramps due to the poison she was being fed and soon after she died and according to a few sources after Louisa passed one of Nanny's sisters came looking for her and so she killed her as well and it was after her mother died that Nanny finally realized that her fourth husband was not the man that she thought he was he was not the perfect man that she had been dreaming of since her childhood she came to learn that he was in fact cheating on her and so she decided that he needed to go richard just mysteriously died on the 19th of may 1953 after his wife poisoned him. Just two months after Richard was murdered, 48-year-old Nanny married once more, and husband number five was named Samuel Doss, officially making Nanny, Nanny Doss. Now, Samuel was from Tulsa, and he had recently lost his wife and nine children after they were killed in a tornado in Arkansas. So he was grieving, obviously, and he was lonely he wanted to find someone else that he could spend his life with and in comes nanny and he was smitten with her he fell head over heels for this woman samuel regularly went to church and he was described as just being a good and decent man so he was very very different to nanny's previous husband however he could be pretty strict and he didn't like the fact that nanny was so obsessed with books and magazines about romance and that she would watch romantic love story things on tv he didn't think they were appropriate and he only wanted his wife watching and reading about things that were educational apparently he also managed all of their money and he insisted that the two of them both go to bed at 9 30 pm every single night he kind of treated nanny like she was a child and obviously nanny didn't like this she didn't like being told what to do but she still acted like a loving doting wife and she managed to convince samuel to take out two life insurance policies and put her as the sole beneficiary now in september of 1953 samuel doss was actually diagnosed with a severe digestive tract infection and he was admitted into a hospital for treatment and it's believed that this infection developed from nanny poisoning him he was in hospital for around a month until early october when the doctors discharged him because he was a lot better and they were sure that he would make a full recovery but then just a week after he was discharged samuel suddenly died his wife, Nanny, had poisoned him by putting arsenic into his coffee and in his food. However, this murder would prove to be Nanny Doss's downfall because as soon as Samuel's doctors heard about his sudden death, they ordered an autopsy on his body because they believed that he was healthy now they discharged him from the hospital so they couldn't understand what had happened what had gone wrong and as soon as his autopsy was conducted they realized that his organs were full of arsenic someone had poisoned this man and immediately 
people suspected his wife, Nanny. So the police were contacted about Samuel's murder and soon enough, Nanny Doss was arrested in 1954. She was taken in for questioning and initially she denied having anything to do with her husband's death. And during her questioning, Nanny just kept laughing as if the idea of her murdering her husband was just so absurd that she didn't even know how to be serious. But the police weren't buying it. They knew that she was lying. They knew that she had done this because she was the only person with opportunity to poison Samuel. However, they were concerned that if she didn't confess, they would struggle to convict her for this crime. After they had arrested Nanny, the police began looking into her background and they put together like a timeline of her past. And it was then when they realized that Samuel Doss wasn't the only one in Nanny's life who had just suddenly, mysteriously, passed away. They discovered that four out of her five previous husbands had died just out of nowhere and so had other members of her family like her mother Louisa and her daughters and her grandchildren. So they began thinking that maybe all of these deaths were no coincidence. Maybe Nanny Doss was a serial killer. And so they started questioning Nanny about the death of her previous husband, Richard Morton. But still, Nanny just giggled and she said nothing. So the detectives gave Nanny two options and they said to her, either you keep lying and denying everything you've done and we'll take you to trial anyway and push for you to receive the death penalty penalty or you tell us the truth about the murders and we'll go a little easier on you and as soon as they said this nanny started to talk about samuel doss's death she said quote all right all right i put rat poison in his coffee he was a miser of a man he wouldn't let me watch my shows on the television and he wouldn't let me run the fan on the hottest nights i mean what woman could live in circumstances like that there you have it my conscience is clear can i have my magazine back now basically nanny brought a romance magazine into the police station with her and they confiscated it. So the detectives made a deal with Nanny and they said to her, if you tell us about the other murders, we'll give you your magazine back. And she wanted her magazine, so she agreed. Nanny went on to confess to some of the murders. So she confessed to the murders of four of her husbands. So Frank Harrelson, Arlie Lanning, Richard Morton, and Samuel Doss. Like I said earlier, the only one of her five husbands that survived was her first husband, Charles Braggs. He was the one that got away. On top of these four murders, she also confessed to the deaths of her mother-in-law, Arlie Lanning's mother, um, her sister, Dovey, her own mother, Louisa, and her grandson, Robert Jr. So in total, she admitted to killing eight people, but she denied other murders, such as the murder of her granddaughter and the murders of two of her daughters. But even though she had just confessed to taking the lives of eight human beings, she seemed to find this whole thing, this whole situation, hilarious. While she was talking the detectives through these horrific murders, she could not stop smiling and laughing. It was actually really disturbing, and this is why she was given the nickname the giggling granny. She wasn't upset, she didn't feel any guilt or remorse, she just did not care. This was funny to her. And she often made jokes about her dead husbands and the methods that she used to kill them. One time she joked about how she murdered one of them by lacing the sweet potato pie she had cooked with arsenic. Now the detectives believed that the reason she killed these people, her husbands in particular, was for their life insurance money. However, Nanny Doss said that this wasn't actually the case. She said that she didn't really care 
that much about the life insurance. The main reason she killed her partners was because all her life she was looking for the perfect man. She told the detectives about her love, well, her obsession with romance novels and magazines and how ever since she was a child, she dreamed of having the best romantic relationship. And she said that as soon as she realized each husband wasn't the perfect man after all, she decided to murder them so that she could keep on looking for Mr. Right. After Nanny's confession, the bodies of the victims were exhumed and after examination it was found that they all had huge amounts of rat poison in their systems confirming that they had been murdered. Nanny Doss was ultimately charged with the murder of her fifth and final husband Samuel Doss to which she pled guilty and in May of 1955 at 50 years old Nanny was sentenced to life imprisonment. Now the state didn't actually pursue convictions for the rest of the murders and I don't actually know why because there was ample evidence linking her to those crimes. I couldn't find a reason for why they decided not to charge her with the other killings, especially the ones she admitted to. She literally confessed to eight murders so I really cannot understand why they would not try to convict her for at least those as well. Maybe it was because they were sure that she would get life in imprisonment anyway just for the murder of Samuel Doss so perhaps they thought it was best not to waste money and resources trying to convict her for the other murders too. I just don't really understand it because from what I can gather they had enough evidence to prove that she was the killer so why not try to convict her? But regardless like I said she was going to prison for life anyway and the jail that she went to was the Oklahoma State Prison where she remained until her death. Nanny Doss passed away on the 2nd of June 1965 after being transferred to the hospital wing of the prison. Her cause of death was leukemia and she died at 59 years old. And yeah that is it for this case. That is the case of the giggling granny or the lonely hearts serial killer nanny doss as i said she was only convicted of one murder however it is believed that her victim toll was actually around 11 possibly even more and yet she never showed any remorse she just giggled definitely one of the most creepy serial killers i have ever come across but yeah that is it for this video once again i do just want to say a huge thank you to stereo for kindly sponsoring this episode remember you can get involved in my next stereo show with kirsty if you click the link in my description box download the stereo app and follow me we are going to be going live on the 25th at around 2 p.m so i hope to see you there before i go i also want to give a special shout out to the members of my patreon page thank you so 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 much for your support guys if anyone else wants to become a member of our little patreon family then the link is always in the description box of my videos please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and i will see you again next week for another mystery with molly bye guys